Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 874. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is August 13th, 2024. All right, thank you for joining us for another episode of Anglican Unscripted. This is the type of episode you're like, we can't even believe we got here. George was having trouble this morning with equipment issues. The camera wasn't working. He stumbled and fell all over his office and dumped over his table. I'll let him tell you about that. Uh, I am here somewhere in Maryland at a campground that is kind of at the Walmart level. You know, this is not... This is not a target level Walmart. So uh, just strange things are happening. Uh, it is a beautiful 80 degree day up here in Maryland. How are you doing down there, George? Wonderful. I started off a little rocky. I believe we're going to have an excellent show because Satan has done everything he can to prevent this show from taking place. My camera died on the computer. And so I went into the closet to find the old camera we used years ago, which I don't throw anything out. Probably not. And I'm looking through, I have all these boxes of cables and c- computer parts and this, that on little the little wire shelves at the top of the closet. And I pull one out and I trip over something and I pull like five boxes of computer parts all over me. I land backwards, hit my head on the desk. Then when I get up, as I get up, I knock the table and the trash cans and I just have got about 45 minutes of cleaning and sweeping to do once we're set. But <sighs> then, and then I couldn't get, they couldn't find the camera. So I had to use an old iPhone camera. And then I couldn't figure out how to link the iPhone to an iMac, which should be an easy thing to do. <laughs> what I found out is that you have to turn on the iMac first, then the iPhone. If it, the iPhone is on first, mm-hmm. it's not the, oh. Steve Jobs, you've got a lot to answer for. Yes, you do. <laughs> All right. So, um, oops, I lost my screen here. The, the world's gone absolutely crazy this week, and we get to cover some of that. Once in a while, As you uh, before I go too far, before we get too far, please like this episode on YouTube or Facebook. It's, it's free advertising. That's your donation for uh, us this week. If you've not done so, please subscribe. You hit that red rectangle, a little bell comes up. And if you click the bell, you're supposedly supposed to be instantly notified if I upload a new episode. Uh, Some people have trouble with that feature. People like George, probably. And so please do that. Go to the comments sections. The comments last week were just alive and well. And, uh, you know, we we received a lot of great feedback for the show, and we really appreciate that. And, you know, if you want to really tell us what you're feeling, you can do that in the comments, and we, we appreciate that. If you've not shared this program recently with family, friend, or foe, what a great time to come out of the uh, the, the virtual closet and say, I watch Anglican Unscripted. I'm one of those people, and you should too. We would appreciate your help. So, George, you ready to move on to the news? Yes, indeed. And uh, and friends, tell your friends about this show because we want to, uh, we want to beat uh, Donald Trump and Elon Musk's uh, uh, numbers last night. 998 million people. Well, you know, <sighs> we can do it with <laughs> we can do it with Anglican unscripted. We can do it. Uh, 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 so, all right, let's move on and talk about the uh, the. We talked about the opening of the Paris Olympics. Uh, apparently, the closing uh, did not involve the Eucharist, but certainly vo- involved characters from the Bible, including the fallen Lucifer. Uh, walk me through what we got to see, George. Well, a little bit of background. Uh, It's been two weeks since the opening. And of course, you all remember the flap. Oh, it has nothing to do with the Eucharist. Oh, well, yes, it does. Um, This time around, we had the closing ceremony dedicated to the rebirth of Lucifer, the light bringer of, of the Enlightenment. What are you talking about, George? Okay, well, the show started with the Golden Voyager, as he was called. Oh, I, now, I, people, I have the I have the original costume here. Hold on, let me pull the pull this up real quick. For, or does it come on? Come on, that's no, not gonna pull up. Too bad. The Golden <laughs> Voyager. Yeah. Oh well, isn't that a reference to the 1977 NASA probe that took these gold discs out into the universe with uh, 
Beatles songs and basically all the evidence of life on Earth? Maybe. Or if we follow along with the symbolism by the same guy who brought us the uh, transgender fat lady Eucharist, we have Lucifer starting the show descending from the sky. And it symbolizes Lucifer's expulsion from heaven. And his posture was leg bent and positioned like the hanged man in tarot card, which in the occult symbolizes the ultimate surrender of man to to say to Lucifer. And then after Lucifer uh, descends to earth, he rises from the gray ashes represented by, in the show by a glowing orange black grand piano suspended in midair, rising up from the ground. And a piano player rides it with it dressed in black feathers representing the mythical Phoenix. And if you couldn't pick that up for ignorant French people, they had the band Phoenix playing the music for the mythical Phoenix. And it ends with Tom Cruise jumping from the stage in Paris to a clip of him skydiving into Hollywood singing, symbolizing bringing the enlightenment to the City of Angels, Los Angeles host of the 2028 Games. This was all Gnostic symbolism with characters from tarot cards of secret knowledge of the spirit of the enlightenment, the spirit of the Bastille, the spirit of the revolution. You know, you can't get as worked up because it's not as visceral as the, the opening ceremony, but you have to ask these people, what have they got to do all day? That makes them, you know, I think this would be entertaining. How did they miss a guillotine scene? I mean, if you're going to do the Enlightenment and the, 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 the French Revolution, you may as complete the whole package and, and cut off Tom Cruise's head. I don't know, George. I, I, they're really big on what happened uh, centuries ago with the French Revolution. And uh, the, I don't know. I, <sighs> well, it's supposed, if I were a French Christian or a French Catholic, most of them are Catholic. Yeah. I would be very concerned because the spirit of France, according to the Olympic Committee, is one of enlightenment, of the Bastille, of secret knowledge, of the elect. And it used to be said that France was the eldest daughter of the church. Well, that's pretty much gone. Yeah, that's over. And, <laughs> and they're yeah. basically making no bones about it. But uh, that, you know, France is a, it's not so much an anti-religious country because they coddle their Muslims. Mm -hmm. It's an anti-Christian country in among the elites. Uh, but that's important. I mean, the elites are what really make up France and, and many parts of Europe. We know better. Yes. And our, our knowledge is so much better. We don't have to even give you an opportunity to tell us what you know because we know better. And everything you know has been our problems of the past. So if we don't let you speak what you know now, we will not have to return to the problems of the past, the things that kept France down, uh, that the, the, the made religiosity the evil of our country. So, yeah, come a long way, George. So, mm. uh -huh. all right, so Lucifer has left France and is headed to L.A., he will, he will be welcome there, I assure you. Let's talk about Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, who had an op-ed this week in The Guardian that denounced patriotism, denounced those who are concerned with immigration as being right-wing radicals, uh, anti-Muslim xenophobes who abuse Christian symbols like the cross of St. George's flag for political purposes. Um this is not the first religious uh, leader of a church to come off uh, making uh, cultural opinions about what's going on out there. I, in fact, I remember Archbishop of Canterbury telling me about uh, the Minneapolis riots, the town I was born in, and said, you need to really be understanding of the rioters here. You have to do, put yourself in their bodies and understand and have a little calm and patience with uh, these BLM writers because they, they're they doing it for the right reason. George. Yeah, Justin Welby had a uh, editorial in The Observer, which is the Sunday edition of The Guardian. 
And his argument was that, uh, you know, violence is wrong. No problem there. Okay. But, but, he, but where he basically crossed the line was that anybody who's concerned about the unchecked immigration into Britain is right wing, which in British discourse right now is code words. And then they're racist. And then they're supporters of criminality. So Justin Welby condemned out of hand the majority of English people, Welsh people, Scots, Northern Irish, who do not like what has become is happening to their country. I happened to, you know, read the African newspapers. And one little article I picked up and I sent it to Kevin was that the British High Commissioner, which is the ambassador to Nigeria, reported that his office had issued 740,000 visas for Nigerians to either emigrate or study in Britain in the first seven months of this year. 740,000 Nigerians legally coming to Britain. And did anybody ask the British people if they wanted this? Now, you know, we had a story at, oh my goodness, 700 migrants crossed the, the English Channel in boats. Well, that's bad. But if the embassy in Nigeria is giving out 740,000 visas for people to come, and when they come, they get housing, they get education, they get medical benefits, they actually get more benefits than the a British pensioner. And Welby says, if you think that's wrong, you're a racist, you're a bad person. So Welby has basically given his unconditional support to Prime Minister Keir Starmer, and Starmer's uh, very hardline approach to, if you complain, you'll be arrested. Now, Starmer, uh, the poli Metropolitan Police Commissioner, I think his name is Crowley or Rowley, uh, sort of tickled people's fancies by saying, we're going to try to extradite Elon Musk for X allowing all this news about the riots to take place. Because what we're finding, you know, if you're in England, you may not know what's going on because if your Sky News and the BBC are your sources of information, you're being lied to. In the United States, on the regular networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, there's nothing about the riots in the UK. Nothing with cable, at all. And cable television either. I mean, you yeah. won't find an MSNBC, a little bit on CNN, but no, this is largely something that you will only see on Twitter, X slash X. So. And so, and what you're seeing on Twitter is not manipulated information. Mm -hmm. In other words, the the uh, the networks in the United States are infamous for uh, editing clips of saying of Donald Trump <laughs> saying something. Yeah. In other words, the most famous is the fine people hoax. There was a, a a march in Charlottesville, Virginia, 2019, I think it was, or 2020, of uh, neo Nazi. You know, it, it's it's Cowboys debated to this yeah, who, yeah. The, who these people were. You know, yeah. they were all, uh, whatever it was, they were espousing racist ideas. And the, Donald Trump was asked about this, and he gave an answer, and he said, there were some fine people in Charlottesville who were protesting the removal of statues of Robert E. Lee and whatnot, but then well, he, uh, Trump went on to say, but these people doing X, Y, and Z are awful and terrible. Well, what the networks did is that they edited the clip. So the only thing that you heard repeated again and again and again on the network news was Donald Trump, Donald Trump saying there are fine people in Charlottesville cut to the neo-Nazis and Klansmen marching, which is not what he said. And we, I, I've come to the point where I really believe nothing uh, without independent uh, investigation. Seeing is no longer believing. Hearing no. is no longer believing. Yeah. Um, and we're seeing this in particular in Britain uh, with the uh, editing of news to take away uh, things. And there's a recent poll where only about, I think it was 40% uh, of Britons sympathized with the rioters. Why so high? People ask, I would say, why so low, given how uh, pervasive the immigration and cr crisis is in Britain? 
Um, and I think it's because people are being brainwashed by well, the media. Yeah, I mean, if, if you don't believe the site, don't believe what you see, don't believe what you hear, don't believe what you experience, believe what we tell you. Yeah, because we're, we're pundits now. We're not just reporters. The BBC uh, and other networks in uh, the UK have an amazing influence. They're part of the culture. They're like the NHS. It's, it's part of us. It's who we are. And uh, we sit down, I don't know what time, 6, 7, 8 o'clock at night, and we get our news from the BBC. And if there's an important update, the BBC will upgrade, uh, update us as well. I posted something on Facebook that got a lot of comments from uh, foreign uh, friends of ours, many in the UK, who you could just tell have become uh, British socialists for all intents and purposes uh, and have no idea what liberty, freedom, honor uh, mean. And uh, uh, this this uh, Facebook post got 72 comments as of like two days ago. And people are just going off and off and off on not understanding uh what freedom really means and uh, the role America plays in that for the last 400 some years. But I digress, George. <laughs> well, no, you don't digress because you've hit the you've hit the true issue here. Liberty. Uh, the liberty that, you know, in the United States uh, arises from the Magna Carta, which led to the uh, Declaration of Independence in the U.S. Constitution those things are being deprived of Englishmen and women and Irish and Scots and Welsh. Yeah, yeah. We had an 18 year old uh, remanded to prison awaiting trial in Belfast for watching riots. Watching. He wasn't participating, but he was watching them. And the judge said, <clears throat> I don't care if you were just watching, uh, you're going to jail until we figure this out. So Britain is in the midst of a two tier we complain in the United States about a two-tier legal system. Uh, BLM rioters can burn down federal courthouse and Portland can ov overrun the Capitol building, do this, that, and the other, and nothing happens to them. A little old lady can walk in, it can be invited into the Capitol on January 6th by a Capitol policeman. Little lightning strike in the background. Okay, <laughs> something else fell over. <laughs> and and then uh, be sentenced to up to 10 years in prison for, uh, for uh, you know, insurrection. In Britain, we've had several cases being reported of people, online violence, which is in and of itself is not a thing. Violence is physical. It cannot be mental or emotional and done over the internet. That's a non sequitur. It can happen, but still can happen in British law. And of people, getting several years in prison for re retweeting things, for posting comments, for posting things that are rather anodyne, and they can go to jail for several years while people, while immigrants can rape and in some cases murder people and get less than six months in prisons or no jail time at all. The, the one I saw this morning was Muslim father of six who had raped several women I think it was Glasgow or Birmingham, someplace up north. No jail time because he needs to take care of his family of six. Well, well, I'm sorry. That, the British taxpayer is already <laughs> taking care of his family of six. <laughs> right. yeah. uh, they're paying for his housing, his food, his education for his kids. And he's just out raping women because he's basically given an income to go out and do sex crimes. But he gets no jail time. Whereas... Uh, you know, a man who cursed at the police and, you know, shuck a fist at them gets two years in prison. A white Englishman who's no, with no criminal record. Well, last week it was the uh, uh, Isla, is Muslim person who went to trial for rape and he explained to the judge, I did not know rape was wrong, therefore the judge let him go. And that's a different type of uh, court system than I understand here in America. We've seen stupid things like that happen here. But it's not the norm. And if that's becoming the norm in uh, the UK, you have problems. Now, I've seen on my Twitter threads and my Facebook people suggesting, well, maybe the UK or England needs to have a civil war. Maybe it's time to raise up 
arms, well, there are no arms, raise up and, and fight the, the tyranny. And I'm like, you can't. There's nothing you have to fight against. Uh, your only war can happen in the ballot box. Here in America, we, we've kind of corrupted our ballot box to one degree or another. But in England, that's the only place left, or I should say the UK, the only place left to fight any civil war. Because your weapons are gone. Well, partially, partially. Part of the problem in England is we can blame Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. Mm -hmm. uh, Gordon Brown s said to the Church of England, the government will no longer appoint bishops. You just tell us who you want. Now, up to that point, there was a check on the sort of incestuousness of the church. So that, for instance, Margaret Thatcher made George Carey Archbishop of Canterbury when the Church of England did not want George Carey to be Archbishop of Canterbury. And he was the last good Archbishop of Canterbury. Under Tony Blair, they created the Judicial Appointments Committee so that judges selected other judges. Now, what does that mean? That means that you've got a little clique, and over time, it gets more liberal, more progressive, more progressive, and there's no recourse for the average citizen or for the government, so that you cannot remove judges, you cannot have good judges put in because the judges pick their successors and they pick their buddies and their ideological allies. So the ballot box will do nothing to reform the judiciary. Uh, the, the ballot box will do nothing about these judges who uh, put, you know, jail people immediately, uh, no bail for these uh, riot crimes, but let uh, rapists and uh, murderers go free because they don't speak English or they didn't know it was wrong. Um, that the second point I want to make is America has more guns than people. Uh, oh, a lot more, yeah. And there is and also because we have the decentralization of law enforcement, and the decentralization of authority, there is no way that the federal government, should it choose to do so, can compel anything in a state. The last time this actually happened was in Arkansas when Dwight David Eisenhower had to send the 101st Airborne Division to Little Rock to integrate the public schools. And the Arkansas National Guard and state police, the governor decided mm, we're not going to fight the 101st Airborne Division. But that that structure remains. The army, you know, the only way the, well, so there is a very different, the United States is so very different. But the we had the IRA provoking mayhem and mischief for generations in Northern Ireland, where the gun laws were just as severe as they are in Britain. But because these guys had basically no hope, they were dead, enter dead enders. There was nothing they could do. The only thing left to them was violence. If I, I, I do not predict, I, I'm not saying this will happen, I'm just foretelling that if it can, goes down this road, we will start to see violence of people so disaffected that uh, what's left of them is setting off bombs at police stations uh, because the police are now the enemy. Yes, I don't know. I, I, like George Orwell, can just see a society folding onto itself. I can see, uh, you know, London Air For Airstrip One just uh, starting to accept it and learning that it's more comfortable to uh, to trade your ideas, to uh, change history, to uh, become part of a collective than it is to be individuals. Now, well, we don't have, obviously we don't have that here in America, but well, the and but the BBC is right now in the middle of changing history. They've got they're running a series on BBC, I think BBC Four, on the life of George Orwell. Painting him as oh, a nasty what? misogynist man. No, <laughs> they're painting they him as really? a villain. <laughs> so basically, you and I can cite Orwell with with uh, praise and pride, and you know he was very, you know, ahead of himself, ahead of the times, all this and that. But the British radio listener is now being told that he was a monster, a human monster. Wow. Okay, I didn't know that. <laughs> all right. 
Oh boy. So okay, and yeah, you guys so are. At the, <laughs> at the end, and at the end of the day, your church, which in the United States would be a counterweight to the government. In other words, the Martin Luther King Juniors uh, marched against the church. Even Episcopal clergymen marched with the civil rights movement, marched with Martin Luther King in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. And the letter, you know, letter from the Birmingham jail Martin Luther King Jr. wrote was written to the Episcopal Bishop of Alabama. Those were the days when we actually counted or mattered in the world. But you don't have that because Justin Welby and the House of Bishops are creatures of the blob. They're in lockstep with the liberal left-wing atheist agnostic gnostic elite mm. all right well we we just unloaded a little bit on the archbishop of canterbury uh story number three we have here is oh it's welby again welby under file fire for uncritically backing the icj condemnation of israel we need to work on your sentence structure for uh, an uneducated person like me trying to read it george um let's talk a little bit about uh, archbishop welby and what he's he's doing to screw well, israel well last week we reported about welby giving his uncritical backing of the international court of justice which is mm -hmm. a left-wing uh group that has no credibility at least in the united states and certainly no influence in international affairs save when their opinions are of uh, use to the people in power. Mm -hmm. They denounced Israel, saying that the uh, occupation of the West Bank and the settlements are illegal and Gaza, all this and that and the other stuff, just the same sort of junk you've heard for generations. Well, he buys into it uncritically. Uh, this week, we've had the pushback. We've had really heavy blows against Welby. Melanie Phillips, the... Uh, uh, commentator, English commentator, she's Jewish. Yep. She calls, had an article about him called The Archbishop of Kant that really just sliced him to pieces. We had some independent Christian leaders, 40 of them, signed a letter that was, was much more sweetly written, including the uh, mis uh, mission of uh, Christian ministry to the Jews, CMJ. Um, we have that in the United States. Daryl Fenton, uh, ACNA, uh, fellow heads that I think now um, saying, look, Justin, you're, you're, you've drunk the Kool-Aid, you've bought into the Palestinian lie narrative that it's historically untrue and morally bankrupt. And Justin does this in the middle of uh, the, uh, you know, the, the board of deputies of British Jews uh, which is sort of the the organizing committee for Jews in England. One of their groups uh, reports anti-Semitic incidents, and they're up 40% this year, personal attacks, 250% on synagogues attacks. And so anti-Semitic activities are on the rise. We've had marches through London with the mass, you know, Muslim immigrants saying, kill the Jews. Of course, they don't get arrested. And... In the middle of all this, Justin Welby's pouring oil on the fire of anti-Semitism in Britain. He's joining the Jew haters in making Britain, trying to make Britain uh, Judenfrei, uh, Jew free. And meanwhile, this may happen while we're filming, Iran's supposedly going to be attacking Israel any moment now. And oh, by the way, uh, David Lammy, the foreign minister, has blocked British arms sales to Israel because the left wing of the Labour Party wants to have an, an inquiry into genocide by Israel against Gaza. And where is Welby? Welby's on the side of the fruits and the nuts and the anti-Semites and the bigots and the liars. And this is the Archbishop of Canterbury, who, oh, by uh, the way, hasn't said anything yet about Paris, even though everybody else <laughs> in the religious world has. I mean, I don't think he understands symbolism. I'm, you know, it is what it is. I do like what uh, President Putin said last week. He said to Iran and Hezbollah, you can attack uh, Israel, but don't kill anyone. Because he does not want a conflict breaking out in the Middle East when he's trying to kick Ukraine out of his own country. 
Um, it just, uh, what's going on now is just absolutely crazy. Uh, watching international politics, the wars that are going on, um, and uh, it, it's hard for us every week to come in and report this. Uh, but we're doing it, and we're coming up on a, an election here in, in America that'll just be completely off, off the rails. Um, our last one. Oh, you let, no, got two more stories. Revolution, Bangladesh. Uh, Three more the, stories. You skipped well, over John Smythe. Where am I going here? I just not been. I'm sorry. I'm in a new location, and I'm right off this Navy uh, air base here. And you probably heard one jet get by because I can hit my mute button on my level, my my microphone has a mute button here. But darn it all, uh, I still have to hear it, even though it's muted for you. So I, I'm using a little concentration <laughs> as they fly in. But I'm sorry about that. Let's get back here to the real news here. Um, yep, Sixth anniversary of the death of John Smythe in Sa South Africa this week. A promised report on the evil things he did while he was a priest um, never has... For been brought to, to fruition, George. I've not seen it. Uh, the, what are we going to do here? Well, Smythe uh, was an evangelical lay leader who uh, engaged in uh, sadomasochistic uh, activities, abusing uh, young men. Mm -hmm. It is alleged that Justin was this for over 30 years, from the time he was a, uh, an officer at the UN camps. Uh, to the time he lived in Cambridge and he lived in the house uh, at one year of the uh, one of the trustees or the head of the Ewing uh, camps uh, and uh, to his life as a priest. He supported uh, Smythe financially after Smythe fled to Africa, first to Zimbabwe, then to South Africa. Allegedly. No. Uh, uh, well, Yes, they, okay. I mean, yeah. this is Private Eye has stated that Welby mm -hmm. supported, and Private Eye has not pulled it back. And Private Eye's got more uh, libel lawyers <laughs> on uh, well, speed dial than okay. you and I have friends. Well, let, 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 let me br break it. Let me break in here with a little bit of reality. We don't really have to say allegedly for anything we report out of the UK, because when Obama was president, he passed what was called the Speech Act. The Speech Act uh, forbids all the uh, travel by um, legality that anybody who wanted to sue an American for their opinion or libel or defamation just had to go to an English court to do it. So if I were an ups, uh, really upset uh, person from Singapore, and I get a lawyer in uh, the UK, they would sue a citizen of the uh, United States for us and um, they would usually win because of how we interpret the laws here. President Obama passed the Speech Act that says, no more, you're not allowed to do that. All uh, those cases will be determined by American law and American yeah. jurisprudence. Yeah, Brit British defamation judgments have no uh, reach in the United States. You've okay. got to start all the way over and you have to prove actual malice. Yes. Uh, rather than uh, mistake. That doesn't mean we're not going to be careful, but I just want you to know, uh, we get I get threatened more than I should from uh, people we talk about, and uh, the only guy I have to thank for my safety is President Obama. I, well, he signed the bill. It <laughs> he was signed the bill. Congress, Congress wrote it, he signed it. <laughs> yeah. So. Okay, so, Welby, uh, according to Private Eye, up to the very end of Smythe's life was sending him money to support him. Smythe's been dead for six years. I think it was Christopher Hancock, Bishop of Bath and Wales mm -hmm. at the time, the Church of England's lead safeguarding bishop. I may have the name wrong. Uh, you can correct me. And please correct me in the comments. Um, said, yep, we've got a review. We're going to look into this. We're going to get to the bottom. We're going to name names. Six years have gone by. And the latest is sometime late, maybe late this year, maybe next year. This is outrageous. I mean, you know, this is just shows seriousness. And I don't know if that anything has to do with the fact that because Justin Welby is implicated in this, they're going slow. 
they're going slow. You, you'd have to ask yourself that question because they went so quickly when they went uh, and tried to take out Bell or they try to take out our, our, our favorite Archbishop. Uh, George biggest, Carey. George Carey. Yeah. Um, they, they, you know, they got the, the little machete out and gotcha. <laughs> but when it comes to a serious investigation of the time with relevant informative documents and eyewitnesses, nothing. I don't, I, it, you know, Welby just received a knighthood, uh, KCV, okay. a Knight Commander, Victorian Order, a personal gift of King Charles for organizing the coronation. I think by the time all is said and done, Welby's going to have to hand that back because of his uh, uh, role in the cover-ups of abuse. Hmm. I don't, I don't know that for certain. Yeah, no. I'm just speculating, but if everything that's been reported and plays out. This is not good. And, oh, coincidentally, yesterday at the Kingston Tan upon Thames Crown Court, courtroom number nine, the trial of Jonathan Fletcher began. Mm -hmm. I looked up the docket okay. and it said plea and trial trip preparation set for courtroom nine yesterday, Monday the 12th. So the Fletcher case is starting to make its way through the Church of England, uh, through the civil criminal courts of England. Um, and truth be told, this will this will hurt the evangelical uh, elite there. Kevin, a good thing because that means people like Justin Welby, who have uh, well, I'll just stop. I've, yeah. I've been piling on a bit much and. Yeah, and this isn't the Justin Welby uh, show, so. Show. But, um, but the poor fellas just managed to be. We haven't had any, any Indian corruption this week to sort of drive Justin out of the uh, out of the frame. But man, his, his everything just is hitting on top. Of, I wish he had better press advisors who would, you know, have him have photos taken of him petting little lambs or visiting sick children in the hospital or eating tacos in South America, you know, that's, you know, that's much safer than uh, criticizing the British public, ignoring abuse, covering up uh, bad acts of bishops. Well, it, that's what makes it difficult to be an archbishop of what am I supposed to talk about? What is my role? Because uh, he plays an international role as the uh, first among equals for the uh, primates. And he plays a symbolic role also within England as the Archbishop of Canterbury. And uh, you do have to choose your words. Cl uh, and you should have learned this from Rowan Williams in the Sharia law thing. But you have to be very careful about what you speak about uh, in this day and age of social media. Uh, not only will people take your words out of context, but in today's media, they will slice and dice videos and audios of what you said to completely change the meaning at all. And, you know, I don't know. I, I, I think he could be doing a much better job. And we're going to talk about that right now. Bernard Randall case has a new turn. Um, if Bangladesh. You, don't don't, you want to do Bangladesh? I just had another. You didn't. You, did you hear me mute the, the microphone? I had another jet go by here. Yes, revolution in Bangladesh. <sighs> Sorry, Justin. <clears throat> <laughs> Moderator of Bangladesh calls for prayers as Muslim extremists are murdering Hindus and Christians. How many Christians in Bangladesh? Not a lot. How many Hindus? A lot. So, the uh, president of Bangladesh, who's pretty autocratic, been in power for about fifteen years, was chased out of the country. She had to flee to uh, India mm -hmm. because there was a revolution, and the revolution was over affirmative action. The Bangladeshi Supreme Court uh, civil service jobs in Bangladesh have uh, reservations for certain groups. And I believe 30% of the civil service jobs are set aside for descendants of, of the War of Independence yep. veterans. Mm -hmm. And people have challenged this because there's some set aside for religious minorities, so many for women, so many for this, so many for that. And the average Bangladesh 
Bengali Muslim who goes to university, hopes to get a job in the civil service, he's got to compete for only about the 20% left that are open for merit appointments. So eight out of 10 are already set aside for people not based on merit, but based on class or race or gender or this and that or historical circumstance. And students began to revolt. And that's why they revolted because they're basically being told that the civil service, which in South Asia is a very uh, good career path, uh, out of poverty and into the middle class. You can't do it unless you're one of the 20%. And so the riots began, and it's now been taken over by the uh, Islamist extremists because the country has fallen into a bit of anarchy because the Supreme Court justice fled, the uh, the government members of the government fled, and you know the people around the prime minister, president are gone. And so Hindus are now the targets. And so there are videos coming across X or Twitter of Hindus being dragged through the streets after they've been murdered, temples set afire, villages uh, burnt down, women raped and murdered. The violence we saw at the partition of India between Pakistan and India in 1948, we're seeing repeated now in Bangladesh today. Christians, who are much a smaller minority and are not, uh, and not really mixed into the Bangladeshi population. Christians are either the in the elites in the cities or tribal tribesmen in the hill country who've been, you know, converted by Christian missionaries. They're not living, most of them don't live cheek by jowl with their Muslim neighbors in small villages. Hindus do. And the Hindus are being murdered. And the archbishop of the, the moderator of the Church of Bangladesh has asked for prayers and international appeals to help end the violence. I asked Lambeth Palace on Friday if Justin Welby would back the moderator's call. Uh, and I got an answer on Monday, we'll get back to you. Well, of course, on Friday, he was writing his Guardian editorial attacking the British people, defending Muslims. So maybe he couldn't switch gears quickly enough to condemn Muslims for murdering Hindus. I don't know. So we'll see if we get an answer this week from Lambeth Palace. <laughs> or they might still be mad at me for uh, <laughs> pointing out the Rose Hudson Wilkins is a DEI hire. We'll see. Okay. Don't make me bleep anything again. Okay. So let's move on to uh, uh, Bernard Randall. A uh, little background here. In 2019, Randall delivered a sermon to the students at Trent College, if I remember correctly. And he was asked to address issues related to the school's adoption of the Educate and Celebrate program. In his sermon, Randall discussed the program and emphasized that students should be free to make up their own minds about issues of gender and sexuality, encourage them to respect different opinions, and referenced the uh, opinion that comes from Scripture. That didn't go over so well, George. Yeah, Trent College actually was a, a Evangelical Church of England uh, boy. Uh, boarding school. Uh, mm -hmm. England colleges are usually what we would call boarding schools or high schools and universities are yeah. what we call colleges. But well, So Randall gives fairly anodyne. In other words, think for yourself. Here's what the Bible says, sermon. The headmaster of the school suspended him for not buying the gay line. And then he was, then he was marked down as a safeguarding wrist for stating his beliefs on Christian sexuality. Okay, crazy headmaster, crazy school, thinks that sh should settle it. No, the Diocese of Derby, led by Bishop Libby Lane, who was the first woman diocesan bishop in the Church of England, then blacklisted him and invested him for safeguarding violations. And this past week, an expert legal officer, Gregory Jones KC, KC stands for King's Council, mm -hmm. uh, concluded the Derby Diocese safeguarding team have provided no evidence to justify Randall's being marked as a safeguarding risk to children for his Christian beliefs. And they found evidence that the diocese had him from employment for giving a sermon stating Christian beliefs and that it had departed from the guidance and had given, uh, how are you supposed to do this? And they're not given any reasons to do this. It was then taken up to Justin Welby. And Welby was told by this 
Gregory Jones, that Welby was, quote, plainly wrong and, quote, had misdirected himself and had, quote, had misunderstood this. Nothing and not discipline Libby Lane over her blacklisting this priest. And then Welby admitted to this lawyer that Lane had not followed the black safeguarding practices. But Welby said, well, it's no big deal. But the lawyer, Jones, was told Welby this was an egregious uh, error and a gro uh, was, an, was an, 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 a gross error. And Welby also ignored a safeguarding complaint issued against Libby Lane, who had been herself guilty of abusive behavior, allegedly. And the, 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 this judge basically concluded all the evidence points to the fact that Bernard Randall was blacklisted, was cast out, was uh, attacked by his bishop because of his beliefs in basic Christian theology. Now, to make this worse, hearing about this to examine Libby Lane's conduct, and at the last minute, it was canceled by the president of tribunals, Dame Sarah Asplin, who said, let's have an independent review and a committee study this. <laughs> Well, it's been six months since the decision by this lawyer, and Randall's still not given his license back to officiate. There's been no uh, apology from the Bishop Lip Lane. Uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury has done nothing about Libby Lane's misconduct. And so the Christian Concern, the group led by... Uh, Oh, and, um, okay. Andrea Minichilla Williams yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, is announced that they're going to pursue a judicial review of Aspen's decision not to proceed with the disciplinary case of the, against Bishop Libby Lane. Yeah. I, Friends, I, if you want to see evil at work, this is it. This is the Archbishop of Canterbury colluding with evil, with the demonic. I know people will roll their eyes when I say that. But our enemy isn't Justin Welby. Our enemy isn't Libby Lane or people like that. It is Satan. And there are people doing the work of Satan to destroy the church from within and prevent people from coming to a knowledge and saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah. Trent College was grooming children. It had introduced a new program, and it did not say that they had their choice of what to believe. They said this LGBTQ curriculum is all that should be believed. And, you know, Mr. <clears throat> uh, defamed, libeled uh, rector here, chaplain, uh, said, no, you should believe what you want to believe. And here's what scripture says. Nobody stood up to defend scripture except the guy who was defamed by the Archbishop of Canterbury and Libby Lane. Yeah. And this, for me, is in so ways, so many ways, emblematic of the rot in Western society, not just the Church of England, not just in British politics, but in Western society that we have surrendered truth to those who claim to have secret knowledge about the, the, the uh, who have a higher knowledge than we peasants. In other words, we, you know, Libby Lane can't be touched because she's one of the elite. She's one of the great and the good. And her actions, evil actions, cannot be judged by the likes of you and me or by a court because she is one of the elect. Bernard Randall is not one of the elect. He, he, can't, he must be hammered and smacked down for challenging the views of the great and good. My well, friends, this is how revolutions start. And... Yeah. I'm not advocating violence. Uh, far from it. I think violence is a terrible thing. Uh, don't burn down Libby Lane's house, friends. Don't burn down migrant hotels. But I can see where the anger that would lead people to think about it arises. It becomes satanic and evil when inclusivity is at war with tolerance. And mm -hmm. that's what we have here. We have a new program of inclusivity where we know better because we're elites and one of the tenets of inclusivity is tolerance 
But no, it's not. You are at war with tolerance. Where is the tolerance for biblical belief? Where is the tolerance for this man's uh, speech and freedom of speech and freedom of religion? Freedom of religion in the UK. I mean, I, we, could, we could spend all day talking about this, but you know, here's, here's that vast reality. Nobody in authority is defending scripture and nobody in authority is d defending uh, Bernard Randall. You know, it's sad. What, and we started with the Gnostic Lucifer bringing enlightenment show from the Paris Olympics. We know better. You may think, yeah, well, that's just the French. They're crazy anyway. True. But my, <laughs> but, but my but friends understand that this worldview, this ideology, is what we see on display from Justin Welby. Mm -hmm. It's what we see on display from Libby Lane. It's what we just see on display from those senior evangelicals who are hiding and covering up the sins of Jonathan Fletcher and John Smythe. They wrap themselves in the mantle of Christian respectability. They say the right things and wear the right outfits, but the spirit of Christ is absent from them and they are fully over, they're fully enwrapped, fully engaged, fully immersed in the Luciferian worldview. Well, like Lucifer, they want the approval of men. Justin Welby here is seeking not the approval of uh, God, uh, the Trinity, but the, the approval of men and the press in UK society. He'd rather be approved by them than uh, approved by uh, the convictions we find in Scripture. The BBC and the Telegraph have both called this case the, uh, look it up here, the test case for religious freedom in the UK in September 2022. They, that's mm. what they, they declare this. So Justin Welby is on the wrong side of Christian history for the UK's test of religious freedom in the UK. Uh, yeah, that's how that's how you make England script is being on the wrong side of history. Yeah. Now we ask ourselves, is he stupid? No, he's not stupid. Is he ignorant? No, he's not ignorant. Is he brainwashed? Yes. Okay. I would say he has <laughs> brought into what I would call the Guardian, the BBC worldview, the elite worldview. Mm. And one of the things we mentioned last week is he'll never be accepted by the elites because he's seen as suspect coming out of H Holy Trinity Brompton, being an old Etonian, being a, being a Christian minister. Yet he lowers those things that have made him in order to buy the approval of a group of people who will never approve of him. And in some ways he becomes more extreme in advancing the Gnostic cause. Justin, straighten up, fly right. It's not too late. No, no, it's it's called repentance. Seek the Lord first. You know, um, I do we have time to talk about politics? Sure, uh, we have sure. Time. Okay, hey, we got five minutes. Uh, I I I've listened to two hours of Elon Musk uh, having a conversation with Donald Trump. I learned nothing new. Don't you know? Nothing new there. But you know, this Donald Trump. Uh, I've watched. Kamala Harris uh, for the last two weeks being a now presidential candidate and because she doesn't do press conferences I've learned nothing new. Um, although I've come to, 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 to mind now that basically this is a campaign between the mean tweeter Donald Trump and Ray Gunn Kamala Harris. Okay and uh, do you may see that Olympic uh, debut of Ray Gunn? The, uh, oh the uh Breakdancer. The breakdancer? That, From that's, Australia, Kamala, yeah. that's Kamala Harris. It, it, you know, and, uh, so, bringing joy to the world, Kamala is. So, uh, politics is so crazy, George. Um, we had one thing that you know, the, uh, the Democratic nominee for vice president, uh, Waltz, from your home state, Minnesota. <laughs> he, <laughs> yes, he, he is. <laughs> he's, he's, um, he's a character. Um, he's a cute inflating his rank in the army and of have, having 
quit his uh, post as a command sergeant major for his unit just as they were about to be sent to uh, Iraq or Afghanistan. All right. Yeah. And the chaplain of his battalion went on Twitter and called him a coward. And I got to tell you, folks, when the ch army chaplain of your unit calls you a coward, it's not his other sergeants or his, or his direct officers, but when the chaplain, who usually is the last guy to know anything in a battalion, um, it's like a, a rector of a church. He's the last one to know. If Waltz's reputation was as a coward and he's being labeled such by the chaplain of his unit while, where Waltz served, man, there's some problems there. He left some bad, uh, I don't know the truth of uh, all of this stuff, but man, there are some people who really are angry with him. But, you, okay, boom. We've just identified um, the biggest problem is not Waltz. It's not Camilla. It's not Donald Trump. It's the power of the media here. Um, mm -hmm. It can make a coward into a war hero. Uh, it can make a cackle into a roar. It can make a misdemeanor into uh, a hate crime guilty of uh, a death penalty. You know, all because of the focus they can they can uh, show. Uh, you know, Donald Trump isn't innocent and everything. I, this is not a Donald Trump defend him program, but I just look at the whole sphere of media influence here in the 21st century, and it's a, it's a, and you and I are part of the media. We, we get that. Yes, we're pundits. We get that. But wow, uh, I remember you know back in in the mid 80s, some friends of mine on both sides would complain about media influence and partisanship in the media. They ain't seen nothing until you know the next few months here. Yeah, nothing. I'm Kevin Coulson, and I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode eight hundred and seventy-four of Anglican Unscripted.